Genesis chapter number 3, verses 1 through 6. I want to take time to read what the Lord is saying. And look what the Bible says to the angel of the church in Sardis. Right, these are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, yeah. your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wow. Verse 2 says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Jesus. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. Wow. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. But will acknowledge that the name before my God and his angels. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to come from a subject um, very briefly. I want to talk about just give me Jesus. Amen. Just come on. give me Jesus. Just, just that's all. That's all I need. Just give me Jesus. Hallelujah. Just give me Jesus. I'm, I'm starting a new series, church, in the book of Revelation. Which is a powerful book. Yes. But before we get to eschatology, which is the study of the end times, the study of the end of the world, with highlights and Revelation chapter 13, dealing with the mark of the beast, which is another currency, another economic system, deals with also the Antichrist and the false prophet. Before we navigate to those waters, I want to take time to deal with something that is our primary focus in the Word of God as we deal with the book of Revelation. Yes. Come on, Pastor. In the book of Revelation, we see the Apostle John is the one who gets the revelation on the island of Patmos, and as he gets this revelation from God, he writes the book of Revelation as Jesus gives him the revelation. And in the first three chapters of Revelation, he focuses on something that is very primary. He focuses on the church. Yes. Because as I'm understanding and as I believe according to the word of God, the church is the main institution that God is going to use to usher in this next level of healing, restoration, and advancement in the earth. He's going to use the body of Christ. He's going to use the church. And what I want to take time to deal with is the complexities that we have with church because many of us, our definition of church is shaped by our personal experiences with church. And your personal experiences can get in the way of God's true definition of what the church is designed to become. Oh, Depending on your personal experience of what you have encountered with church, what you have dealt with with church, your viewing of church, your understanding of church, all of that can literally disorient the power of God that he wants to use in your life. The church in the Greek means ecclesia. Mm -hmm. Simply means ones who have been called out. And what God wants to let you know that in this body, in this congregation, that there is many people in this room that has been called out of something. Come on. For the Bible says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's what makes up the church of people who have been called out of sin, of people who have been called out of and so can you get an agreement this morning that God is calling me out? I'm not there. Some of you in this room, you already came out. But there's some of you that are still stuck into the world. You're still stuck into the ways of the enemy. And God in this season, he is calling you out. Oh, God is calling you out. God is calling you to a new level. God is calling you to come forth. And what I love about this time that we're in. Yeah. God is evening the playing field yes, yes, yes. where there has been different ranks and different approaches. What what you mean by that, Pastor? Because before the pandemic, uh, there was a standard or a blueprint that another person had that you had to look to to get advice or guidance of how to live life. Wow. So in other words, if you didn't 
know how to parent. There are certain people in your groupings, your grandparents. There are certain people, older people, elders that you can look to and say, how do I raise children? And they will give you the blueprint or the terminology or the concept or strategy of how to raise children. If you are a leader or a pastor, you can look to another pastor that's successful, that's growing, and say, how do I grow a church? Or you can go into the library and read books on church growth and how to develop systems and plans of how to grow a church. If you've been married, all you have to do is look at someone who has a successful marriage and an elderly marriage and say, how do I have a happy, successful marriage? And they can give you a blueprint. This is what you do and this is what you do. But the question and the challenge that we're having now is many of them have never survived, experienced, or lived in times like this. That's a pandemic. Many of them have never parented in the pandemic. Many of them have never been married in the pandemic. Many of them have never led churches or businesses in the pandemic. So guess what? God has evened the, the playing field. So you can no longer look to a book, look to YouTube, look to man, but you have to look up to the hills. Which come of your help and all of your help comes from the Lord. Yeah. He's even the playing field. And so we're all on the same level because we never have experienced this. We don't know how to get through a pandemic. We don't know how to raise children in a pandemic. We don't know how to come on, start a business and be successful in a pandemic. You can't look to a book. You can't call nobody on the phone. You can't get no advice from an expert because no one has ever experienced the seasons and the valleys that we're in. But I do know a one who knows how to bring you out. I do know one who has answers and solutions. I do know one who has strategies and structures. So you gotta look up to the heels which comes. Your help. Uh, God said you've been depending on man's voice and not my voice. So now I'm gonna even the playing field. No one can look into no one to see who's not doing who. But I gotta trust in the voice of God. I gotta trust in the presence of God. Prayer has to be my resource and not a documentary on YouTube. Uh -huh. the playing field. Right. Mm. Wow. I used to look to certain people for advice. I can't because we're dealing with the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Come on, yeah. Yeah. And this is what the power of the church is and this is what he's doing. We all are in this together. The power of the yeah. church is our ability to corporately learn how to do life together. Yeah. And the trick of the enemy is to get you to think you can do life by yourself. Oh. Uh, this is how you will come on, not survive in times like this because you think that I can look to other sources and look to other gadgets for the help of God, but I gotta turn my place to prayer. I got to get around like minded people. Come on, I gotta get around people who think Bible and not think opinion. I gotta get around people who know the true God and the true word of God. I got to change my surroundings because your surroundings. Uh, I can't be around people who think kingdom. I got to be around people who think about kingdom because it's in those environments where I stay strong. It's in those environments where I would not turn to the government. It's in those environments where I would not bow to bail. It's in those environments where I would not lose my faith and lose my confidence. Many of you, your mind is under attack because you can't even pick up the phone and call somebody and say, come on, can you just pray with me? Can you just war in tongues with me? Can you help me deal with the enemies that are presenting themselves before me? Uh, two is better than one, and God is telling you this season, this is not a season of seclusion. This is not a season of isolation. This is a season to collaborate with like-minded people that surround you. And that's what makes the church so powerful. Because we, if you go into the text, we, there's seven churches that God deals with. Mm -hmm. And we want to take time to go over two churches today. Jesus Christ is doing an audit in the wow. book of Revelation. As he's doing an audit, looking at the inventory of the churches, he's noticing the churches are not equipped. They don't look the way he desires them to look. And, and we see, if you would give me the Bible here, in Revelation chapter number 3. Uh, because right here in the text, we see 
to the verse one says to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? In other words, the word angel there in the Greek means a messenger or pastor, right? Because you must understand before God can deal with the body, uh -oh. he has to deal yeah. with the neck that is above the body. Christ is the head, right. the leader is the neck, and the church is the body. Right. And if the neck is not in position, the body can't get what it needs from the uh, from the head. Come on, help me out of here. And so what God has been doing yeah. in these times, what he, he's dealing with. Come on, pal. This is what he says. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God. This just was a manifold. There's another terminology dealing with the Holy Spirit of a different sevenfold, sevenfold uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit that comes with God. And then he says to the seven stars, because not only does he deal with the pastor, the seven stars deals with the, the leaders of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's not only wants to deal with the pastor, because the re reality of it is you can have a pastor that's in right standing, but if the pastor is in right standing and his leaders are in wrong standing, oh, right, right, right. the church cannot become healthy. And so the order of how God deals with it, he says, I want to deal with the pastor. I want to deal with the leaders. And then from the leadership, then I move on to the body of Christ. Because if the leaders can't follow the pastor, if the leaders can't get their lives equipped to become all that God has called them to be, how can the church have all Because the worst thing you do is have a jealous leader under the pastor. Yeah. <laughs> because most churches, all you have when it comes yeah. to leadership is competition. That's right. And there cannot be any competitiveness because we can't have completeness if there's competitiveness getting in the way. Wow. And so in, in the I want you to read this because look what the scripture says. Because he then says this, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. Let's look at the first component of the scripture. He says, I know your deeds. Yes. This church has some amazing deeds. Yeah. Wow. If you will come to this church, they were doing the kingdom work as regards to that looks like deeds. They, 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 were, they were having outreach programs. Right, right, right. Uh, that they, were, they, were, they were serving the community. They, they had programs in place. Uh, they had a lot of things that they were doing. They, they were going out to the community doing all different kinds of service. So the church uh, had good deeds. They had things that they were doing and things in place. Right. And then he says, I know you have a reputation of being alive. Wow. In other words, wow. many this was a popular church. Yeah. Woo! Okay. Many people love to come to the church because the church had some popularity because they were doing deeds in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Reputation, a name. And the, what God is showing me is the problem with many of us, we're too busy trying to create a name. Yeah. <laughs> and in the kingdom of God, can I give you some revelation uh, this morning about That's this? Right. Because I want to give you a revelation. Number one, no one in this room is called to go after a name. Come on, right now. Come on. Wow. Another word for to be known. Yeah. Wow. Right. And many of us are seeking a name and seeking to be well known and seeking a reputation. But in Philippians 2 and 7, the Bible says, Jesus made it of no reputation. Wow. In other words, when Jesus came, he wasn't looking for any recognition to be well known, to be known in the history book. He wasn't looking for anything. All he wanted to do was 
wants to submit his life to obey to the assignment that God had for his life. He made it of no reputation to humiliate himself, to humble himself, to go through the death of the cross. And then that's what God said, because you were looking for a reputation, I'm going to give you a reputation. And then he said, I'm going to give you a name that is above every name. And that's why our reputation don't matter, because at the end of the day, Jesus' name is above every name. Oh, not just, come on, your mother.
us to understand what God is saying regarding coming alive because in the kingdom you can be living and dying at the same time. And many of us in the church, we're living and we're dying at the same time. We're inhaling air, we're putting on clothes, we're going to jobs, we're living in a community. We think we're living, but in actuality we know that we're dead. Because if the part of you which God created, if that part is not fully surrendered to God, you're not living, you're just existing. And we think we're living because everything is going good at work. We think we're living because I just bought a new car from Canon. We think we're living because I got everything that I need and want. We think we're living because on the external, everything looks decorative and in order. But on the inside of us, we understand that our life is jacked up and broken. On the inside of us, we're Existing, but we're not living. So we're dead. And one thing about being dead, dead people loves environments and surroundings that are dead as well. One principle in law of real estate is how they value a property is not just based upon the condition of how the property looks. It's not just how well the floors are placed. It's not just how pretty the walls look. It's not how well put together the paint and how well together the sheetrock in the house is in order. And that also determines the condition, but one of the main things that can devalue the property or the amount of value in the house is the neighborhood. Because in the neighborhood, if the neighborhood is ugly, if the neighborhood is damaged, if the neighborhood has torn down abandoned houses, if the neighborhood has all different kinds of brokenness around it, eventually all it's going to do, because of the deterioration of the neighborhood, is going to cause the value of the house to come down. And so though you, the house value is $250,000, because the neighborhood is dead, the neighborhood is abandoned, the neighborhood is broken down, it takes the value from two hundred and fifty dollars to $75,000, because all oh, because it's in a broken neighborhood, a surrounding, an environment that does not contribute to the life and the value of the house. And if you are in environments, relationships and friendships, these environments that we have, that say either your environment is changing you or you're changing your environment. God has sent you to be a change agent. Change agents change the environment they don't let the environment influence them. That's right. And when you don't know who you are, when you don't have identity, when you don't know what God, who God has created you to be, you will let what's around you shape who you are. You will let what's around you mold your character and your emotions. You will let it control your viewing and what you say. You will let it dominate who you are. And this is what's prohibiting us from walking into the next level of being what God has called you to be a leader because leaders know how to not let the environment change their mind, but leaders can come to the environment and change the environment by standing on what God has placed in their mind. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Good. Wow. So he says you did. And I'm to the place I'm tired of looking whole. Yes, Lord. We'd rather look whole than become whole. We'd rather look fixed rather than to become fixed. We'd rather look like we're delivered rather than actually becoming delivered. I'm in a place in my life now, I'm no longer trying to care about appearance anymore. Come on, because I serve a God that can care less about appearance. Come on, they do know David made, I'm sorry, no, never David made this way, but Samuel made this mistake trying to present God with appearance. And he said, I understand what you're saying, Samuel.
smartest person in the room. Most of the time, the smartest person in the room is actually the dumbest person in the room. But they're the first one to speak because they're trying to use knowledge to hide or project their insecurities. And so you know sometimes the person who talks the most in the room don't really know nothing. They're just in a place where they're trying to say the right things to get you fooled like they really know something. But behind their words, they don't know nothing. They don't know from the difference between dog and cat. But we sit there and let the appearance of people fool us. So true. I don't want them to look like I got a happy marriage. I want to actually have a happy marriage. Yeah. I have a happy marriage. I'm talking about in the general. I'm trying to get you to see. I, I want you not to just look like we're happy, but actually become happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. No longer getting gratification of the appearance. Right. Jesus. The picture has 700 likes on social media, on. but behind the picture, you can't stand each other. Wow. in the world but dry at church. Just take time to look at your club life. Look at your club life and just take time to go back and reevaluate how you were in the club. And I don't know anybody in this room that was maybe like me sitting over in the corner. But I know some people in here, if you turn on the right song, I'm going to shut it down. Yeah. Yeah, Y'all know what I'm talking about in here. If you clean your jam, you say your dance, my jam. And when the DJ drop my jam, I'm going to lose everything that's connected to me because I came to dance. I came to party. Yeah. 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 I came to show out. Yeah. 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 song if you went out to hell. You still was juking and jiving and bucking your body. But I don't understand, Providence, how we come to 
take all that. Uh, that's why you ain't got all that. Because you don't know what it takes to get that. But David is the one who took the ass out of his clothes. Because he knew what it took to get to the glory of God. But we serve a generation that's saying, don't take all that. Yes, Lord. It makes me un no, I'm a little uncomfortable. Because worship is intimacy. Yes. Many of us, it amazes me, we don't like to get intimate in the spirit. But it's hard for you to get intimate in the physical. Come on, help me out here. You don't mind taking your clothes off in the physical. But when it comes into the presence of God, you can't take off who you really are. You're pretending to be who you told to hold yourself to be at work. And take it off and say, God, this is who I am. It seemed to be a lot. They were popular. They had a lot of likes on Instagram. Yes. Their social media was blowing off the hook. Yes, Many people flocked to go to church. They were standing in line because they were having no reputation but to Jesus. They were dead. Yes, sir. A church, I'll be careful because, let me say this, if you like performance, more than you like prayer, this is the quickest way to kill off a church. Yeah. Come seeking a performance. Many of us come to be entertained. Right. I hope the preacher say something to make me laugh. He has to preach something that's funny to keep my attention. Because you are dead outside of church because there's no connection to the word. Wow. When you have a devotion life and when you're in the word, the preacher ain't got to say nothing. Be no comedian. Ain't no comedian. I'm not Kevin Hart. Y'all got to help me out church. I ain't God ain't called me to make you laugh. This ain't no, come on, talent show. Who you think? This is a place of deliverance. This is a place of change. This is a place of breakthrough. I'm not here to make you laugh. But we still leave here fighting. Put a timetable on God. But at your friend's house, you can stay till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. You get aggressive in the space table. You throw your car down. says here. Um, the scripture says this. Um, 
that be alive with your dead. But look at verse 2. He says, wake up. Strengthen what remains or strengthen what's left over and is about to die. He says, he gives a specific, he says, wake up. And how is God trying to wake us up in this season? Number one, he's trying to wake us up through the prophetic. Yes. You cannot dismiss the prophetic in this season because the prophetic is the alarm clock. Yes. It's a revelation. It was the trumpet that yes. was sounding off to wake the people up. Like in hotels, some hotels still have the feature to where if you will call the hotel attendant and ask the hotel attendant, I want to wake up at 8, give me a wake-up call. Come on. When 8 o'clock hits, the hotel attendant gives you a call at 8 o'clock because the hotel attendant's job is to wake you up. Yes. And that's what God is trying to do in this hour. He's trying to wake us up. He's trying to get us out of a place of distraction. He's trying to get us out of a place to where we're divided in our thinking and our emotions. Wake up, says the Lord. Yes. He's sounding the alarm. He's trying to get you to come out sleep. He's trying to get you to come out of slumber. This is not the season to be found sleep. Wow. He wants you to wake up. And waking up is through the prophetic. It is the tool. When God releases the prophetic, the prophetic is what brings like a gold detector. You ever been to the beach? Generally, I would see people with gold detectors walking around the beach detecting to find gold. Because underneath the sand, people drop things all the time. Yeah. But it's the detector, the gold detector, that's able to penetrate through the sand right. to locate the value of the gold. And that is what the prophetic does when prophecy goes forth from God's true prophet. Prophets, prophecy is able to go through the sand of your soul and your personality yes. and find the gold that's related in your heart. Yes, that's good. Thank you, thank you. Because God wants to pull out the things that's on the inside of you, but he has to work through the sand to get there. The prophetic is designed to work through the sand to get to the gold. Yes. Right. It says, wake up. And you know your sleep is because you keep ignoring the warnings of God. You keep disobeying God. God keeps sending messages to tell you to surrender to him. You keep overlooking it. Your focus is still on things that don't even matter. And you're taking the grace of God as being casual. Because you think God giving you more chances is based upon your talents and not based upon his grace. And I don't care how talented you are, it doesn't prolong or give you more grace or extend more grace. It's through the Son, Jesus Christ, that extends more grace to you. So he says, wake up, strengthen what remains. One, you know, one of the days that is the most happiest day and the most depressing day is payday. <laughs> But a couple of hours later, I go from being happy and I'm all back to say. Somebody knows what I'm talking about here. Payday. When the direct deposit hits your account, because of the hard month of toiling on the job, working long hours, dealing with different personalities, keeping your cool, working hard.
Because there's some things already accounted for. That's just like that analogy, that's possible that the enemy is already taken. He's already taken out so many of your, of your peace. He's taken out so many of your years. He's taken out so much of your time. He's used relationships that will not call to you. He's used a man. He's used a woman to take out so much time. They've taken out everything from you. They've taken and they have taken and they have taken. And you can't do nothing about what they've taken. Right. But you can do something about what's left. Yeah. And how you manage what's left is going to dictate. Can you see the promises of God? Or will you fall to shame? Can you What's left? What's left is the key to how you will survive in this season. God is going to use what's left. He's going to use what you got to die. I come to tell you, you think just because the enemy has taken from you all these years that you ain't got, God says you got something left. God says, I'm not telling you to go back to 2006. I'm not telling you to go back five years ago. I'm not telling you to go back to get opportunities that you've wasted. I'm not telling you to go back to get time that you cannot get back. I'm not telling you to go back to get people that you cannot go to get back. But what God says, what are you doing with what you have left? What, how are you managing what's ahead? And how are you managing the time that you have left? How are you managing the assignment and the gifts that God has left and afforded to you? What are you going to do with what you have left? Yeah. Amen. The disciples told Jesus he was feeding the 5,000. They were saying, all right, we fed everybody. It's time to go. And the you know, disciples said, you know, Jesus, what you, you want us to get these leftovers? He said, yeah, don't, don't, don't leave them. Don't let them waste. Okay. He said, gather the leftovers. Some of you know what that feels like to be at home when you couldn't go out to eat every night. But it was something about leftovers that can move and lean and move you on beyond a day's time. Come on, help me with you. There's something about leftovers that, that when it marinates in the barbecue another day, beyond the day that you ate it, I wish I had time here. Some of you know what it feels like to eat on leftovers, and the leftovers taste better than the meal that you had present. Come on, because when the leftovers sits behind, it lets the marinade of the sweet potato yam juice, it lets the marinade of the barbecue to consume, come on, the food. And so when you're ready to sit down and warm it up, it's better than when it was before. And God said, if you can trust the leftovers in this season, if you can use what I got left over, it's going to take you wealthiest part that God wants. It's the part of you that conquered. It's the part of you that got through that. God wants to use what's left mm. over. He tells them what remains, what's left over. You got to use it. Telling them that you don't have much time left. You don't have many opportunities left. You don't have much resources left, but you got something left. He tells them to strengthen what remains. Mm. To strengthen it. Yeah. To maximize it. If God gives you one, can you give him five? Oh. Yeah. There were three men with three different groups of talents. One had five, one had two, one had one, the one had five, invested, worked it, got five more. The one had two, invested, worked it, got two more. He says, Man. faith are you over little things, I will make you rules over it. But the one who had one yes, sir. Yes, sir. did not work what he had. He did not maximize what God has given him. Yes. And when God gives you something of great value, even if it's just one, Come on here, when he comes back to see what you've done with it, has it grown? Teach that. Come on. Has it maximized? Has it doubled? Has it tripled? Mm. Right. God, I remember the day that me and her, we only had three people sitting in this room. Preaching to and teaching to. Yeah. Three. Come on. And I worked the three. I loved on the three. Come on. I cried with the three. We both prayed and interceded, taught the three, labored with the three, yeah. interceded around this church, believing that one day that from the, the front to the back it will be full. We worked what God gave us. We worked what we had. Yes, sir. And through faithfulness, God honored it. And now he has, not us, has used our faithfulness to maximize and do what we can do ourselves. Amen. Amen. 
And this is going to be the secret to your life growing. Is when what you have left, how can you strengthen it to allow it to grow and go beyond years in time? How can it exceed your physical ability? So my last thing he tells them in verse 3. <clears throat> you want to do this. He says, I found your deeds to be unfinished in the sight of God. They had unfinished assignments. This church has unfinished assignments. Who will step up to help us finish the assignment of God? Who will come alive to help put their hands to the plow, not for a reputation or name, but to see the name of God? And the scriptures we didn't go so further on because the Bible said verse 3, remember therefore what you receive and heard, hold to it fast and watch to the key word. This is on done. He says repent. He says repent. You know, we don't I study the word repent out because all my life I thought repent was feel sorry and feel better. Come on here. Come on here. <laughs> when we mess up, when we sin, when we fall, I thought how you repent cry, then feel better. Say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. And then feel better. Yeah. Grieve for it for a little while and feel better. Yes, sir. That's what I thought repentance was. And this is, repentance is so serious to God. I don't have the time now Take to talk time. about how serious repentance Take is. Time, or to even assess, is our repentance sincere? Mm -hmm. Because what brings the anger and the wrath of God upon us is when our repentance is counterfeit and not authentic. Amen. And we think we can manipulate God mm. by turning on church music when you mess up in the car, drive and cry in worship, and God's going to take your pity. Wow. Oh. Take your time. We think that's true repentance, and that's not true repentance. The word means metonemia, and the word meta means to change because of who you've been with. When you've been in the presence of God, the pre his presence is enough to change who you really are. But it simply means to change your mind. Repentance means to change your mind. Amen. True repentance can't take place until your mind is changed about it. Amen. It's not external to what you cry about it, fuss about it, grieve about it, complain about it, and then go forward. True repentance is when your mind has been convinced that this is not the will of God for my life, that God is not pleased that this is hurting my wife, this is hurting my husband, this is hurting my family, this is hurting my church, this is hurting people who are connected to me. So it causes you to change your mind. The only way you can change your mind about it, there has to be a relationship with the Word of God and the Bible, the Word, is able to change your mind according to the behavior that is dysfunctional before God. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. It's true repentance. So, if you haven't applied a scripture to that sin, and if you don't know a scripture, then how can you say you're fully repentant? If you don't give the scriptures advice and the scriptures of direction to how to turn from it, how can you really say you're repentant? How can you say you're repentant from bitterness? How can you say you repented from complaining until you know what the Bible says about complaining? What the Bible says begins to shape your thinking. And when your thinking has changed, your behavior has changed. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. But we cannot repent until we first allow God, not society, not culture, change your mind as relates to the area of struggle that you have. So true repentance. As we move forward, because God says that he wants true repentance and to see he don't want this repentance that you have learned from fake people in church. Yes. He don't want you to take on this repentance that's emotional and not spiritual. Yes. Yes. 
He don't want you to take on this repentance that says, I give something, and that's my way of the Lord forgiveness. God says you can give all you want to give. If your mind had changed, if your thinking had changed, when it comes to that particular area, it is not true repentance. If you keep going back to it and then giving justification and reason to why you go back to it, it's not true repentance. True repentance, and when the mind has changed concerning the action and behavior, and when the mind has changed, then the behavior has changed, and then true repentance has taken place. Yes. True repentance is not saying it's too hard. Let me go back to it. And then when I mess up, ain't nobody perfect. We all make mistakes. Everybody falls. And then, or when you do fall, you jump all the way in. See, God said this is really the true issue that he's having. One slip of you think, since I slip, let me just dive in. Wow. Help us. Jesus. I've been that way on a fast. God told me, don't eat nothing. And here I am, sneaking a twix in. Eating a twix to break my fast that morning. And no one's around me, no one's not watching me. I have no accountability. I'm talking about as a pastor, I've done this. Come on here. Since I've fallen and eaten the Twix, I just might well go ahead and continue to eat. I broke my fast off. The Lord told me, okay, you ate the Twix, but God said, change your mind, repeat, and move on and fast the rest of the day. But here I am, because I ate a Twix, this gives me permission to have Wendy's for lunch. And then that gives me permission to sneak them a quick chicken tenders in. That gives me permission to eat something else. And here I am, extending and falling farther in grace. All because at least I did it once, I gotta keep doing it. I said one cuss word. Now I love that it real. They made me mad. They want to ran my pressure up. I'm going to let all of them know how I truly feel. I said, no. Once you say that one cuss word, you truly repent. You ask for the Holy Spirit to help you. You study what the Bible says. Do not go blessing and cursing cannot come out of the same mouth. You learn that scripture. You go over that scripture over and over and over again. Until that begin to resonate in your heart. Now your mind has changed. Now your behavior has changed. That doesn't mean that's because you make one mistake. Don't mean well, let me just go the whole week and be lazy and don't pray and sit here and do all I want to do because I had a bad week just because you had a bad day. God says, learn to get back up and allow the Holy Spirit to walk with you and your Tuesday and your Wednesday and your Thursday and your Friday all the way till Sunday. But just because. So, Father, we receive. We want to come alive today. I'm no longer being dead. Jesus, we got a journey. Yes, sir. We have a journey to take. This is just the beginning. But we got other churches that we're going to visit. I don't have the time to cover all of them, but we got other churches to visit. But we want to be the church that Jesus says has. There's two churches in Revelation. Two out of seven. But the Lord looks at it and says, they pass. The church of Philadelphia was the faithful church. The church of Smyrna was for the persecuted church. Those two churches will look at their makeup of why Jesus looked at those churches and say, they pass. I'm pleased with those churches. And the other five, he was not pleased with because of the behavior of the people. They didn't want worship. Their works outweighed their worship. They were breathing, but they were not living. So I want to live. I want to be alive. I, I want to be like a running car that comes to a car that can't crank. When you connect to me, when you hear what comes out of my mouth, when you see what's on my life, something in you will come alive because I'm alive. But two cars that can't crank can't help each other crank. 
And many of you are trying to crank connected to people who are dead. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we take time.